Good morning. How's everyone? We got some people that are awake. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord. What holds your heart? What stirs your soul? What matters come to mind? The cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Seeking you will find, joy still comes in the morning, hope still walks with the hurting. You're still alive and breathing. Praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head, keep singing. Lost away from home. My father finds the child inside. We left for growing old. Away, go away, go away, my soul. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurt. Great to see all of you. We got a great, great uh, service planned out today. All of our online people, we're so uh, we're so happy that you're with us today. You are not forgotten. You're a part of this church family and joining us online for this experience. School has begun, so uh, we want to take a moment to pray for all of our teachers and all of our students, all of our administrators. If you are involved, if you're attending school or you're an, a teacher, an administrator, or somebody works in the school system, and you're, and you're comfortable, would you come and just join at the front? And uh, we just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. To ask the Lord to just be with you in this coming year. And, and thank you. Come on, Rebecca. Everybody else, come on. If you're comfortable. I know so everybody's kind of all over the map on where we are, but we just want to pray. Students, we want the students too. If you're a student in school, uh, we, want to, uh, we want to pray for you as well. Because we are believing that God's going to make this a great year for you. And that God is going to keep you safe. And God is going to keep you healthy. And his hand is upon your life. Look at all these people we got that are uh, all these kids that we have. 
it is so, so wonderful to see all these people. Would you just stretch your hand? If you're comfortable with this, we're Pentecostals. Would you just stretch your hand and ask the Lord to be with all these people? Father, we thank you, God, for our students. They, they've either started school or are starting school. And we pray, Lord, for a great year. Last year was just a challenge. And we pray, Lord, that you would just be with them. We pray, God, they are able to go to school. They are able to have that social interaction. They're able to learn in that face-to-face, person-to-person environment, God. We pray, Lord, that your good hand would rest upon them. We ask you, God, that you would keep them safe and keep them protected and keep them healthy. We thank you, Lord, for all of our faculty and our staffs and our teachers and our administrators, Lord, those that are involved in the school system, God, that you will just give them a really great year. Give them wisdom. Let the good hand of God be strong and mighty upon them. Bless them abundantly, Lord God. And we ask you to make this a phenomenal time of learning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give them all a big hand this morning. And uh, uh, you may be seated. And if you are, I saw a couple of people, if you are involved in administration, teaching, raise your hand. My wife has a little gift for you to just let you know how much we appreciate your involvement in the system. If you're online, let me know because we want to send you a little gift by the way. So let me just kind of give you a real quick update where we are. We've raised about $6,000 on our expansion. It's a $107,000 project. It is going to be open. Doug tells me that we will be done uh, by the 1st of September. Probably right after Labor Day, we'll be able to open that whole area, more classroom, more space, more room to, to do what we want to do as a church. And we're so excited about that. If you want to give towards that, just mark it expansion. You can give online on the uh, tithe envelope at the very bottom is the, uh, the web address So how you do that if you want to give online. If you want to mail it in, you can do that. You can give at the back of the room. There are buckets. We're not passing buckets the way we used to, but we just received that at the back of the room. Uh, if you want to pay your tithes and offerings. But uh, here's something else. September the 12th, we're going to have a real... We've done so many things. Thank you. Pam is not in the room, Pam Roberts, but she bought gifts for... Uh, the uh, Timber Ridge Elementary School. We bless those teachers to a good start. And thank you, your generosity, your constant generosity lets all that happen. But September the 12th, we're going to engage with Convoy of Hope in a project called One Day to Feed the World. And we've got a one-minute video that I want you to see right now. Every day we follow a routine. We eat, we work, we relax, repeat. Many of us desire to make a difference, but we don't know how. What if there was one day that was a little different than the rest? Maybe our routine is the same, but the purpose changes. A day where every action has a deeper impact. Each stroke on a keyboard or minute in a meeting translates into differences being made all over the globe. One Day to Feed the World does exactly that. When you give one day of your salary to Convoy of Hope, Every action you do that day translates into momentum. Momentum to make a greater impact. Through children's feeding programs, agricultural training, women's empowerment initiatives, and disaster relief, Convoy of Hope is making an enormous impact around the world. We may not have equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. No one person can do everything, but everyone can do something. That's the power of one. One day to feed the world. It's going to be September the 12th, so begin thinking now. So what we're asking, would, would you consider giving up one day's salary to help us feed the world? Convoy of Hope is an incredible humanitarian organization. Every time there is a hurricane, every time there's a crisis, they are on the front lines of getting help and food and water and assistance. And so that's going to be our next project. And then September 19th is our fourth anniversary as a church. And we are... I know what's going on, but right now we are going big. We're going to have a tent that will seat 200 people. We're going to have a huge dinner. We're going to have all kinds of blow-up games. We are just going to celebrate the goodness of God and what the Lord is doing in our church. And I hope everybody is going to be able to be here. And we're just against this virus. I'm just rebuking this virus every day so that we can celebrate all that God is and all that God has done for us. 
Will you stand with me? And could you just open your heart? Let's let the Lord just move in our lives today. Father, we love you so very much. We thank you, Lord, for all of the good things that are do happening in this church. God, we worship you. We bless you. And as we enter into this time of worship, Lord, may our people sense the marvelous presence of God. Amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out He's working all Let's sing that again, I count I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out
the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands in worship as we praise your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands in worship as we praise your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands and worship. As we praise your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. And the honor. So we lift, so we lift our hands in worship. As we praise your holy name, you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like. about a God who does miracles, we want to pray for miracles today. And uh, one of our families, uh, Kristen Mobley, her cousin passed away, uh, and, and her service will be this week. And then on Friday, her grandfather passed away. And some of you would know him, Roy Sturgeon. Roy Sturgeon passed away, and I'll be uh, speaking at his service on Tuesday at the assembly, but we want to pray for that family. 
And if you're here this morning and you just have a need, doesn't matter what it is, physical, financial, whatever is going on, God knows and God cares and God is able to do miracles. He's able to make a way where there seems to be no way. So if you're here today and you would like prayer while they continue to lead us in worship, would you step from where you are and we just want to gather with you and pray with you about whatever might be on your heart today. As we praise your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands in worship as we praise your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory. As we praise your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands and worship as we praise your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like There is no one else 
glory. You deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands and worship as we praise your holy. As we praise your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like There is none like you. There is no one else. No, not one like you. There is no one else like you. Lord, there is no one like you. And we thank you, God, that you are so, so, so faithful. You are so faithful, God. In this very uncertain world in which we're living, we thank you, Lord, that you are true. You never fail. You never change. You're consistent. You are, you are filled with character and morality and integrity. And now, Lord, speak to us from your word that we might be the people of God in this society. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So glad that you're here with us this morning, and uh, thank you so much, worship team. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. You know, there is no doubt our nation is in crisis, and not just in crisis on one front, but our nation is on crisis in many fronts. We, we, there, there, there's just a, there is a battle. I believe, and, and you know me, I'm, I'm not overly given to, like, I'm not looking for demons and dishes, you know? <laughs> I'm not that kind of personality, but, but there is a battle for the soul of our nation and for the direction of our nation. And, and you can just look, I mean, across almost every front, there's just all this stuff that is going on. But the greatest crisis, I believe, that is going on is there is a spiritual and moral crisis in America. And, and I want to talk to you about that. There's a crisis of character. And that crisis of character is producing a crisis of behavior. There is, a, there is a poverty of values in our nation, and there is a poverty of faith. We have pushed God and pushed God and pushed God to the fringe to such a point that we're getting all this fallout, and, and we're drifting. We are drifting as a nation. I know I sound old-fashioned. Last week, I was kind of old-fashioned. May get that way again today. Wind me up a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's just... Those of you that, I'm, I'm almost 60, so those of you that, you know, that are in that age group, what we have seen in our lifetime is staggering, really. I mean, it's just, we are in a place that I never, ever thought we would be in my lifetime. And, and then I look at these students, and I look at my grandkids, our grandkids, and I think about all of that, that, that what is going on. And it's, it's just like... It's literally like society is, is collapsing. It's just breaking down. It's like a massive sinkhole of morality that, that the foundation has just disappeared and we're just plummeting into this abyss of darkness. And, and you just, I mean, everywhere you look, it's just one crisis after another crisis, all, all the stuff that is going on. You know, a recent poll, this is abysmal. 50% of Americans, Christian, non-Christian, across the board, 50% of Americans believe our nation is in a very poor state when it comes to morality. Half of us believe we're in the tank when it comes to morals and standards and integrity and that. And, and, and we're just literally in a moral free fall. So there is a movie that, that I really, uh, that I love. 
I haven't watched it in years, but, but it's a great movie with a great, great uh, principle that we can learn about that. It's called Rainmaker. I don't know if you saw it, but it's, it's an older movie. It's based on a John Grisham book. And, and so it's about a young guy. His, his name is Rudy Baylor, and he's this young attorney, and he's just getting his start in life. And, and he takes on, he ends up with a lawsuit against an insurance company who does not want to pay for a cancer treatment for a young man. And that young man dies. And so here's this young, fresh out of law school attorney going against a massive insurance company. And, and it's headed up, the, the lawsuit is headed up on the insurance company side by a guy named Leo Drummond. And he is a snake of snakes. He has learned how to take the law and twist it and manipulate it. And ultimately, the kid dies. The kid dies. But ultimately, he wins the lawsuit. And millions of dollars go to the family. But, but here's the teachable lesson for all of us. At the end of the movie, he's sitting in a chair. And he's thinking to himself. He's kind of, it's a mental dialogue that you hear. He says, you know, I bet when Leo Drummond got out of law school, I bet he wasn't like that. I bet when he got into the law, he had a very pure heart and very pure motives. I, I bet he got into the law to think that he could sincerely help people. And then here's what he says. But he says, in everybody's life, in everybody's life, there's a, there's a very defined line between right and wrong, good and evil. There is. And here's what he said. He said, the first time you step over that line, you've broken it. And it becomes easier to break it again. And he said, and if you keep stepping over that line, one day it blurs. And if you keep stepping over that line, one day it disappears altogether. And that is where we are. The line has not only been broken. The line has not only been blurred. The line is rapidly disappearing. The line is rapidly disappearing. So I want to take you. We're in a series. I started this a couple weeks ago. Jesus in a 21st century world. And we're going to deal with some hot button issues during the month of August on some things that need to be addressed from a Christian perspective, but from a biblical Christian perspective. Because just as I said in the first message about Jesus in a, in a non-Christian world, shouting and yelling and having placards that you're going to hell if you don't change isn't going to work. It, it just isn't going to work. You just polarize people all the more. So, so we're going to deal with this today. And I want to talk to you about Jesus in a morally adrift world. Because here's what I love. Everything that we're facing, Jesus faced. And Jesus gives us a model. He shows us how to deal with this very world that we're living in. Our, the 21st century world is a whole lot like the first century world. And, and so we can learn so much from the life of Jesus. So let me just kind of give you the background. We're going to the story of Matthew. Matthew's conversion in Matthew's gospel. And, and let me just give you the quick background, because the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were very concerned about the morality of the nation, and they were very concerned. Rome had come in and was dominating over the Jewish people, and so they are worried that they're, they're going to drift into the, the Greek and Roman moral situation of the day, and so, but their way of addressing it, it's their way of addressing it, their way of addressing it is rules and regulations, burdens upon the people that just become increasingly more difficult. In fact, here's what they would do. They would watch people, and every time people had a new slip up, they'd write another rule. <laughs> Just keep legislating and legislating and legislating more and more rules and putting these burdens on people that they could never keep. Not only that, but their second way of dealing with it is don't touch that. Just avoid those people. Stay away from those people. Cut a wide swath. Don't, don't eat with them. Don't socialize with them. Don't have anything to do with them. Just stay to ourselves. How many of you know those two things do not work? They do not work. On the other hand, here comes Jesus. And now he's living in the area of Capernaum. Capernaum is this beautiful seaside show, uh, town on the northern, uh, northwest corner of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. 
And it is, it's a fishing community, and it's a, it's a bustling community. There's a lot of things that are going on. This is where Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, they have their fishing business. This is where Jesus gets started. And Jesus heals this paralytic, and then he goes out. And Jesus is going to teach us three things about how do we gauge a culture that is morally drifting farther and farther away. What do we do? And we're going to take this apart, and I'm so excited about it, because I want you to grab it with me today about what, what we should do as believers in the 20th. 21st century, walking with the Lord. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as Jesus went from there, he just healed this guy, he's in Capernaum, as he went from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. Now, we got to unpack that, because in Jesus' day, again, the Jews are under Roman occupation, so the Romans need money, they need taxation to support what they're trying to do, to support their agenda. So, they collect taxes from the Jewish people. But they try to make it somewhat appealing because they know, like, if they just set up their Roman guards to do that, that's just going to create more animosity. So they're going to try to create this system. So what they do is they sell the equivalent of tax franchises to certain Jews who, who buy into that, and the Jews collect the taxes because that's a little easier, and then they will pass them on to Rome. It's like buying your own H&R block firm. But here's the deal. The Jews hated these people. They considered them sellouts. You are taking our money and sending it to Rome. And not only that, but the way they made their money, these, these Jewish tax collectors, the way they made their money is they could add additional fees. They could add on extra costs. They could add on extra whatever. And so, so anything that went to Rome went to Rome, but then they got to keep the, the other part of it. I mean, how many of you feel this is a system that does not create a lot of goodwill? So as a result, tax collectors were hated. Kind of a whole lot hasn't changed. <laughs> right? Kind of a whole lot hasn't changed. Except, except these people, the Jews, so hated the tax collectors. Matthew is Jewish, but he's a tax collector. They were so hated, they were banned from going to church. You could not go to synagogue. They were excommunicated. Their testimony was not acceptable in a court of law because they were considered morally corrupt. So this is the people you're dealing with. They're considered on the low end of the totem pole morality. These are not your upstanding citizens that you're, like, you're proud to know. Now, just because it's applicable today, come on, we have a lot of educators in our church. And how many of you know? How many of you meet? You, there are just some parents, you just love them. You see the godliness. You see the morality. You see the concern. And, and you're like, this kid is going to do great. And then how many of you met some parents like, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> it is going to take a miracle to educate this child. <laughs> right? Mm. So that's where we are. That, that's, the, that's the people. Now, here's the deal. Jesus searched him out. When it says Jesus went from there, he saw a man. That word saw in the Greek, it's a very intentional word. It doesn't mean he just kind of looking over the crowd and he sees this guy. It means he's watching. He's watching. He's watching. He's going through Capernaum. And he's watching all that's going on. And he sees this guy named Matthew at the text. He sees what's going on. He sees him the taxes. He sees that he's on the low end morality, uh, uh, morally. He's, they're, they're considered to be notoriously corrupt and crooked people. And Jesus goes to him. He goes to him. And he said, Jesus said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Now watch me. Come on, y'all got to appreciate this. So you got Andrew and Peter and James and John. They're the first four disciples of Jesus. And they are salt of the earth. They are just good, hardworking, middle-class people. They are, they're, 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 they're just good old boys. They're good old boys. Everybody loves these guys. They're good boys. So there they are. This is who they are. And one day, Jesus brings this godless, immoral tax collector and says, he's joining us. How many of you think in Peter saying, excuse me? Right? Excuse me? What, what are you doing? Do you, do you know who he is? He is a tax collector. And he's immoral. He's godless. He's corrupt. He can't be a part of us because how many of you know? Come on, let's just all be real. That's what we do. Somebody comes in and we size them up really quick. You fit me or you don't? Mm. So, so Jesus says, no, 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 no. He, he's, he's part of us now. 
I'm telling you, I just know Peter. Peter's banging his head on a wall somewhere going, oh my gosh, I can't, this is, all thing is going to pop right now. This is, it's just, I cannot believe this is happening. And so Jesus invites him to follow him. So Matthew's been watching because he's a tax collector. He's keeping an eye. So he keeps seeing Jesus. He keeps seeing these miracles. He keeps seeing this teaching. He sees people's light. He sees that Peter and James and John. In fact, Matthew may be a little ticked off because Peter, James, and John and Andrew have sold out of their business fishing to go follow Jesus. So Matthew may be going, there's some, that's cost me some money. <laughs> so there's a little bit of tension going on here. So here we go. And so Matthew says, and, and we don't have the whole conversation. This is a very, this is a very uh, short time period compressed into a single sentence. There's a lot that goes on here. But anyway, so Jesus says, I want you to sell out and I want you to follow me. And Matthew decides, okay, that's what I'm going to do. He just like he sells his tax franchise and gives it away or sells out of it. And now he's going to be a full-time follower of Jesus. He's got to earn his way into fellowship with Andrew, Peter, James, and John. But he says, but Lord, before I do that, I want to throw a party. I want to throw a huge party for all of my friends, for all of my fellow tax collectors. I want, I want to throw a big transition of life. I, I want to throw a big retirement party, so to speak, because I'm leaving that behind. So he throws a big party. Verse 10, it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and the disciples. So Jesus looks at the, at the guys. Come on, guys, we're all going to Matthew's house. And Peter's like, oh my gosh, I got a headache. I, I don't feel good. I got COVID. I, you need a mask. I, no, no, Peter, come on. You're going, I, you know, I'm the Lord. I'll heal you. So come on. So they get there, and they're sitting there, and it's Matthew's, you know, this is Matthew's party, and they walk in the room, and there's already other tax collectors, more of these people. Now, Matthew is, is very, he's, he's really... Um, quite straightforward about the guest list, and many sinners. Now, I don't know what that says to you, but if you're invited to a party where there's many sinners, sinners sin. And this word is an incredible word. It, it literally, I it, it mean, it, it covered a whole plethora of people. It covered drunkards. It covered prostitutes. It covered liars. It covered thieves. It co covered people that shot. I mean, all. So you imagine you're sitting here and all these corrupt people just keep coming into the room. You got prostitutes coming in. You got liars coming in. Because you know, like they've lied to you. You know they have lied to you. They have cheated you. You know that guy. He's a robber. He breaks it. You better keep your first clothes because, you know, we got all this stuff going on here, and he throws this party. This is festivity. Now, I'm sure that Matthew is still coming. I mean, because how many of you know when somebody gets saved, they get saved, but they're coming out of some stuff, right? <laughs> so he's in the process, but he's still got some Matthew in him. So there's probably some things going on in this party that you would not want to be around. Y'all with me still? <laughs> And he's in the, Jesus is in the middle of it. He is in the middle of it. He's not, he's not like the Pharisees going, uh-uh. And he's not moralizing, and he doesn't have a big placard outside, turn or burn. <laughs> he's not from that church in Kansas. <laughs> They'll be picketing me, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> but he's right in the middle of it. He's in the middle of it. Now, verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. So go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus has stepped right into the middle of the moral mush of his own society. He, he is our example. He has stepped right into the middle of all of this. He's invited this guy to join him. He is sitting at this party with all of this is going on. Because here's the deal. People flock to Jesus. 
People flocked to Jesus. I mean, they were so attracted, so drawn. At one point, the Romans said, we better take him out or the whole nation is going to be following him. Everybody is going after them. But here's the deal. He didn't put more burdens on them. He didn't put more expectation on them. And he didn't avoid them. He engaged them. And that is the call that you and I have to this culture out there is that we can't moralize, we can't shout, we can't scream, but we can't hide in our house either. We have have to figure out as the people of God how do we engage people so that we can influence them it's all about having a voice and so now here, here we go I, I have three observations I want to make for you and I want you to get this I really want you to apply this because here's the challenge here's the ch- students y'all have this challenge how do you go out there and befriend people that 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 is not the moral lifestyle that is acceptable to you and your family how do you rub off on them without them rubbing off on you? Mm. And he teaches us three things. All of us. We all got to go. People got to go to work. I got to go to work. I'm working right now. <laughs> all you sinners right here. <laughs> and here's what Jesus teaches us about engaging a morally lost culture. Number one, you have to get close enough to have a voice. You have to get close enough to have a voice. We have no voice if we, if we don't get close enough. There was a day you could, there was a day that there was a concept of right and wrong in our country. But again, let me go back to my illustration. That line has blurred. It's not. I mean, some people do, but there's a lot of people, they have no sense of right and wrong. The line is blurred. The line is gone. They, they don't think there's anything wrong with what they're doing. And it's all about proximity. Jesus had to get close enough to engage them. He he had to build a friendship with Matthew. How many days did Jesus go and hang out at Matthew's booth? We don't know. But wow. And how many times did Jesus hear things and see things that were not acceptable to him? Mm, I'm going to preach in a minute. <laughs> because you, we have to get close enough to show them there's a better way. We have to get close enough to rub off. But we cannot let that rub off on us. Because the religious leaders of the day said, separate yourself. Just get farther and farther and farther away. And, and, and Jesus just, he's not going to do that. He, he sees Matthew and he, he's, a, and I'm, t- I'm telling you, the guy's a sinner. He, he's notoriously corrupt. Jesus watches tax deals go on. It was very well known in that day that wealthier Jews would bribe the tax collectors so that so much taxes didn't go to Rome. So they would have basically paid the Jew, Jewish tax collector, they would pay him even more to cut their portion of the tax that would end up in Rome. And Jesus is standing there watching all this go on. He, he's just watching this. He, he, he listens to people and he watches and observes all of that. And at some point, Jesus decides that, that I have got to intentionally get in this guy's life. i got to get into this life. I do not condone what he is doing, but I cannot, I cannot just leave him out there to himself. I've got to get engaged. And Matthew inserts a powerful little phrase that is so easy for us to just miss. But when Jesus gets there, here's all these people. I mean, they're just very, very questionable people. These are not people that you would normally have over to your house. that all come over. And here's what is so interesting to me. Jesus is reclining at the table. It doesn't say he's off in a corner thinking, oh, my father, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> He's not. He's, he has not. Dis, he, he's not. Now, I think Peter is. <laughs> Peter's thinking, what have you gotten us into? <laughs> but Jesus is right there reclining at the table. He's right in the middle of it. Now, listen to me. Watch me. He's not partaking. He's not engaging in their conversation, in their behavior. But he is in the center of it to be a light to it. And you and I will never change this world until we get into the center of it to be a light to it. And this is over and over. This is what Jesus does over and over and over. In John chapter 8, there is a woman that we're going to look at it on another week a little more closely, but there's a woman. She has been married and divorced five times. 
She is now living with number six because she has figured out marriage doesn't work for her. But she doesn't want to be alone, so she's living with number six. And Jesus seeks her out. He comes straight to where she's at. He gets in the gob, and again, he gets close enough to have an impact. He gets close enough to have influence. He's, he doesn't condone what she's doing. He doesn't agree with what she's doing. He knows that she needs him, but he's going to get there close enough to have an impact. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is at a Pharisee's house. At a, now you imagine this one. You're at a Pharisee's house, and somehow word gets along, and the city, the, probably the most well-known prostitute in the city, comes to where you are. And she comes behind you with a very expensive vial of oil and she breaks it open and she begins to weep and she, and she begins to, to rub his feet. Now, how many of you know that's awkward? Has anybody just arbitrarily come up and started rubbing oil on your feet? That's just, I'm just telling you, I, that would be a little awkward. Right? <laughs> come on, get with me here. <laughs> this is very awkward. Jesus is right there. And this, is, this Pharisee, he is getting angrier by the moment. He is getting angry. And finally, he confronts, he says, what are you doing? What is, don't you know who she is? Don't you know, who, don't you know what her lifestyle is? Don't you know what she does for a living? Don't you know what she's probably going to do when she leaves here? And you're sitting there, and she's rubbing all, all over your feet. And you're just sitting there. And Jesus looks at him and says, she has welcomed me. From the moment I got here, you did nothing to make me feel welcome. You've done nothing to roll out the carpet of hospitality. This woman has done nothing, and she's repenting. She is asking for forgiveness. She is seeking for forgiveness in her life. So again, it's not that it was one time. It's over and over and over. Let me give you another one. Luke chapter, because if that's not bizarre enough, Luke chapter 8, he goes to where there's a demoniac. There's a guy out there, lives by himself out in a, you know, out in a cave because Humanity can't deal with him. And he's got these massive chains, and nothing holds him down. He's got this demonic power, breaks the chains. Now, hang on with me, everybody. Y'all all right? <laughs> he is naked. <laughs> on top of that, they can't keep clothes on the guy. Take me back to the woman in the oil rubbing on my feet. And Jesus puts the disciples into the boat and says, Watch this. <laughs> And he goes there with this guy, and this guy, and the suggestion is, if you understand, now please forget that it's a demoniac for a moment, though. But the, the Greek words for the, the talk about him being naked and unclothed, it's really a word that has a lot of perversion associated to it. So Jesus goes to this very, very perverse man who, who Lord only knows what kind of behavior he is immersed in, and he goes to him. And in every one of these people's lives, he changes their life. In fact, Jesus went so many places that were questionable that the Pharisees accused him of being a drunkard and a glutton and a sinner himself. <sighs> Jesus says that the way in you and I, in the 21st century, the way we're going to engage this culture is we have to get close enough to have a voice. Because if we don't get close, we have no voice. They just put their fingers in their ears and they're not listening. But number two is equally important. You have to have character enough to validate your voice. You have to have character. Jesus was absolutely perfect. Sinlessly perfect. Not one sin. So his own character, his own integrity validated his voice. You and I cannot have influence if we don't live any differently. If our life is no different at all than the world we're trying to reach, why should they pay attention to us? Our lives must be different, but they must be different in a compelling, attractive kind of way. And they found in Jesus this incredible person who was just, he's just perfection. In the Sermon on the Mount, though, Jesus says something very, very important for all of us to hear. And here's what he says. He says, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your, uh, and, and behold, the log is in your own eye? How can you say that? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, here's the deal. We do this the opposite. We think all the imperfections in our life, those are just specks. And we think everybody else is running around with a log in their eye. You know? We come on, we let ourselves off the hook because we know us. Because we got good intentions, even if we don't live it. But them sinners out there, wretched, reprobate people that they are. And Jesus says, huh, you need to flip this. You need to be harder on yourself and more graceful toward anybody else. Right? Take the log out of your eye. Recognize, be harsh on yourself. Be harsh. Don't let yourself off the, don't let yourself get uh, drug into the immorality of this world. Don't let yourself fall into the immoral choices that our world says is okay today. Be harsh. Be ruthless with yourself, but be kind to everybody else. Amen? Are you all with me? Because here's what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your lives are more pure and full of integrity than the religious scholars and the Pharisees, you will never enter God's kingdom. And isn't that interesting? Because who held the higher line? The Pharisees. They had all these rules that were meticulous and almost difficult, impossible to keep. They had all of that. And Jesus said, unless you, unless you, your behavior, unless it exceeds that of those people, you will never enter the kingdom of God. They've got these standards that are impossible to meet. But here's what he meant. You cannot judge the world on the externals. You have to, or you cannot judge yourself on your external behavior. You have to judge it by the condition of your heart. You have to in inwardly examine your heart. In fact, we need to invite the Holy Spirit. Lord, look into my heart. Show me anything that is depraved. Show me anything that is wicked. Show me anything that is wrong. Show me anything so that I can go into this world with a lifestyle that validates the voice of influence I'm trying to have. And then finally, number three, you have to show concern enough to use your voice. You have to show you care. You have to show you care. It's not that I want, I'm just beating you up. I'm, I'm not beating any of you all. I'm just saying, when we're out there in the world, we, we can't just beat people up. You have to have concern enough to use your voice. And how many of you know that takes a while? You don't get that the first day. You don't get that the second day. It, it takes a while. Because here's what he said, verse 12. When Jesus heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy that need a physician, those who are sick. Sinners sin. Because they're sinners. And then I love the way the Passion puts it. Then he added, now you should go and study the meaning of this verse. I want you to show mercy and not just offer a sacrifice. They were great at offering sacrifices, but they, had, they were loveless in their heart. They had no genuine compassion. They had no genuine concern. For I have come to invite the outcasts of society and sinners, not those who think they're already on the right path. Now, I'm going to wrap it up, but hang with me because this is the bow. This ties it all together. Jesus was filled with compassion. He overflowed. He spilled. He leaked compassion. He loved so compassionately. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But here's what the world says. The world says, because here's, here's where the world is wrong, and you and I have got to be different. We've got to get this fixed. The world says, if you love me, you'll accept me. If you love me, you'll tolerate me. And if you don't tolerate me, you don't love me. You're judging me. And the world is wrong. It's the love everybody argument. This is you got to get this because I'm not I'm not saying we're going to tolerate all kinds of sin and all that. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying we, there's a process of getting close and having the character so that you can show the compassion. Because the love everybody argument says that if you love me, you have to approve and you have to affirm everything about me, anything I say, anything I do, anywhere I go, whatever I choose. The love everybody argument is 
right, but it's wrong. It's right that we are to love everybody, but the application and the implication is wrong. The implication is if you love me, then you embrace me just as I am. Jesus loved like nobody's ever loved, but watch this. He loved everybody toward holiness. He loved everybody toward godliness. He did not accept everything the way it was. He earned that voice. He built that relationship. He lived that life so that over time, he could gradually say, you cannot stay here. This is not a good place to be. And he loved them toward a holier life. And friends, that is what we've got to get. How do we love... The world is wrong. This tolerate me society is wrong. But screaming and shouting on our part is not going to fix it. It is loving people enough to get into their life, to spend the time, to invest yourself, to live a godly life in front of them that you can not push them, but lead them. Did it work? Let me show you. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Did it work? Fast forward. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Matthew throws this huge party. Matthew changes. Matthew is a, a devoted follower of Jesus from that day forward. He's, he's not the man he used to be. But here's, where, here's, where, here's the connection. In the book of Luke, at, at, at the end of Jesus' life, now three over three years, Luke 19, Jesus has gone through a city named Jericho, and there's a tax collector sitting in a tree named Zacchaeus. Except this tax collector, it says he was a chief tax collector. He's over all the other tax collectors. He's like head of the franchise. I submit to you that there's a good chance that Zacchaeus knew Matthew. I suggest to you that there's a good chance that Zacchaeus knew Matthew before and after. And Matthew had a chance, or Zacchaeus had a chance to watch the change in Matthew's life. So that by the time we reach the end of Jesus' life, Zacchaeus says, I got I to gotta see this guy for myself. I got to see this guy. And he climbs up in a tree because he's short of stature. And he's hanging out there. And Jesus stops and says, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. Because I'm having lunch at your house today. Now, how many of you know if Matthew had never changed, Zacchaeus would have said, uh-uh, it doesn't make any difference. But Zacchaeus had seen the transformation in a fellow tax collector's life that, G, that the Bible says Zacchaeus hurried down. And now here's the, here's, the moral, here's the moral thing. Zacchaeus is sitting at lunch with Jesus, and he says to Jesus, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. Where did that come from? He saw the change in Matthew. He saw the change in Matthew. I'm going to give half. And then he, it's kind of a confession. If I have defrauded anybody, that kid knows he's defrauded plenty of people. He's cheated. He's taken bribes. He knows that. But it's kind of his way to try to save face. If I've defrauded anybody of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. Where did that come from? Matthew. It isn't, it isn't, there's not a verse it's just your pastor's belief <laughs> that it's the change in Matthew that led to the change in Zacchaeus. We're not going to change the nation this afternoon. But if we can make a difference in one person's life, and we can make a difference in another person's life, and we can make a difference in another person's life, and if we can all do this, and we all do this together, and we all do this consistently, we can change our nation. We can change our nation. So what would Jesus do in a morally adrift world? Get close enough to have a voice? Have enough character to validate his voice, your voice? And then have compassion to use your voice. There's two kinds of people in this world. What I call balcony people and basement people. And basement people want to pull you down. They, they want to yank you right down to their level. But balcony people stand on top and they cheer you on. Who's, who's had the bigger impact in your life? Have people that have torn you down, you're not doing this, you're not doing Have people that have torn you down 
or people in the balcony cheering you on. Yeah, you got that wrong today, but you'll get it right tomorrow. Let's be balcony people. Let's say, here's what he did for me, and I know what he can do for you. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to just pray. We've had prayer for students and prayer for the needs of the church, but, but I want us to pray, Lord, Lord, let, the, let this message really stick in my spirit. Let this one be, let me go out, Lord. Let me be enough salt and let me be enough light to have an impact and influence on the culture that I live in. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you, Jesus, that we have in Matthew, we have the absolute personification of what you did and what you said. And I pray, Lord, that these three very simple little principles that I shared today would really live in the hearts of us, God. I, I pray, Lord, that this is one of those messages that it really sticks in our spirit, God, and that it, and that it makes us wrestle with these questions, Lord. Am I... Am I close or have I just pulled so far away because I, the morality of our nation is so nauseating that I, I don't want to be around it? Am I close enough? And, and, and do I live the life? Is there enough character in me that if I had a voice, anybody would listen? Or, or is my character, has my character betrayed me? Has my integrity, has my own moral lifestyle, has it betrayed me that nobody would listen? And am I concerned? Do I have your love, God? A love that loves unconditionally, but a love that loves toward holiness. A love that loves toward godliness. A love that doesn't push anybody, but a love that leads people. Leads people to a higher moral ground. As we leave this place today, I pray that all of us will wrestle with these thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being here today. Introduce yourself to someone if you have a chance. Everybody online, thank you so much for joining us, being a part of the online experience. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.